What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. As always, this is your boy Will Weir checking in. How you doing? How you living? Joining me today, for my podcasting cousin from across the pond, the leader of the Taylor gang, the one and only Adam Taylor. What's popping, Adam? Yo, what's popping, Mr. Will Weir from across the pond, my podcasting <laughs> cousin, my homie, my compadre. How you living? Nah, I'm only joking. I'm fucking around a little bit. Hey, man, come, come on. Take my stuff, baby. That's that's what we're here for. We're here. We're here. To, <laughs> we're here to share ideas and share gimmicks because, man, we are we're running dry on content right now in the offseason. You know, we are just dying to get to, you know, the next couple of weeks we got to get through before we get training camp started. And, uh, man, it's. It's been a struggle these last these last couple of weeks, man. And now that we got you know FIBA World Cup out of the way, it's it's about to get real lean these last last few weeks here, Adam. Yeah, it's the cotton mouth for the NBA calendar. Dude. That's what it is. It's just dry and nothing. You're there, just searching, man. just searching for that you know last, that last cup of water that you can find, or that last last little bit of Coca Cola in the back of the fridge. You just need something to to get a little taste in your mouth. But, yeah, instead, all we're left with is dirty bong water. That's all. That's yeah, left. it's tough, man. It's tough, man. But you know, like I said, FIBA was wrapping up, so let's 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 chat a little bit about FIBA. We'll hit we'll hit Jason Tatum and Jeff Goodman had an article uh, that came out a few days days back we'll hit that and then adam i know you have an article coming out on celtics blog that we want to hit as well that ties in pretty nicely to that jeff goodman and jason tatum piece but let's start with fiba just because that's the most recent news that we had so the other day we're recording this here on a monday morning so i'll be honest i did not wake up at 4 30 3 30 my time to watch usa versus canada was a fantastic game but one that ended up in a fourth place u.s finish a massive win for for team canada who you know obviously has not been a part of international basketball tournaments at this level uh in a very very long time uh and of course we were all hoping usa versus canada was going to be that gold medal game and i mean from at least you know uh, an entertainment standpoint it was the game that we were looking for as far as usa versus canada but i gotta be honest adam waking up sunday morning finding out that Dylan Brooks dropped a 40 piece, just about a 40 piece on Team USA to win a medal was not the news that I was expecting. You didn't know Dylan Brooks could do that? No, because I had didn't, no idea. Didn't see that coming. They're not going to lie. I had a bingo board. Dylan Brooks dropping, being the leading scorer in USA versus Canada, not up. You know what? I'm not even going to lie. I wrote a little quick hit yesterday for one of the sites I work for, shout out Yard Barker. And the piece was just Dylan Brooks is like the ideal Ime Udoka guy, right? Okay. Like he's over in Houston now. Both of them are. And the way Dylan Brooks, Brooks plays, the way he's, he embraces being that agitator, that that hated guy, um, you know, the way he's going to go after those tuxedo guys, as Ime and Grant used to call them. Yeah, he's going to slot right in there, dude. Um I don't see him dropping a 40 piece during the season. He's not going to be yeah. featured like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I think Team USA's confidence had been shaken after losing to Germany. So it is what it is. I will say this Germany are world champions, not the Denver Nuggets. I don't know, man. We might need to set up a game. I think that would be a fun one. Daniel Tice versus Nikola Jokic. I feel like that's the matchup that everybody. That's the thing, though, for. right? If, if they're playing in Germany, that means that it's a, a into, like these European guys are always going to choose their national team over an NBA team. So there, there's so, not. So Jokic would actually probably be on. Which, which, funny enough, that was the missing piece to that game yesterday in the gold medal game, right? Germany versus Serbia. You know, they they made it to the gold medal game, and they didn't even have right now what's widely considered the best player in the world and this is one of the arguments i saw everybody was like well america didn't have their best players available that's completely fair you didn't there was no jason tatum kevin durant um lebron <laughs> i was gonna say joel because i saw someone put up i, think I mean that's Sam possible Green. yeah that's joel Embiid is possible that's not i mean that's, no that's, LeBron. Kind of the, that's the biggest olympic mystery going in the next summer but it was also no Jokic, no Giannis. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some other teams were missing some No very... Sabonis for Lithuania, who we still lost to. Some No Porzingis for Latvia. Yep. You know, there's some very, very high No Wemby European. for France. No Wemby for... I'm, 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 ref I'm refusing to comment on whether Wemby is elite right now because we haven't seen him play. And I Is don't that already to... a debate out there? I, I think it was a debate from like 
the moment he got drafted. How yeah. elite is Wemby? And I'm just well, like, no. forget his eliteness. Did you see the man's flexibility the other day? On Yo, the dude, I was jealous. That's wild, like, bro. Yeah. That, is, that is a seven six alien <laughs> right there, bro. He he belongs in Men in Black, not the NBA. I don't know if you used to get them out there when I was a kid here in the nineties. We used to get these little egg shaped things. And when you opened it up, it was like an alien that was like sticky and gel. And like people used to tell you they could make babies and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Did you ever have them out I, there? I mean, I, I feel like I have a, a vague recollection of something similar. I definitely didn't hear the, you know, the, the wives' tale of they could make babies. Yeah, you could but have like, a baby. You, was this was like around, you said like an egg thing. So was it like around Easter that this would happen? Or No, it was like, it was literally just an, a, it was like an alien toy. You'd throw it to the wall, it'd stick. Then it'd like, yeah, I mean, I mean, to a degree, I know what you're talking about. There's similar versions to what that. What people used to say, yeah. to, like, I remember as a kid, they were like, you know, if you get two of them and then you stick them together and put them in the egg, you get a third one. And like, it was just a wives' tale. <laughs> like, matter of kids that bought extra just because. Yeah. But I remember thinking when I was watching Wemby do that, like, dude, he looks like exactly how those aliens used to look when I cracked open those eggs. Like all folded dude, up. Maybe like, maybe Wemby's the result of a, of a mad scientific experiment where they put like 75 of them together and you get a Wemby. Oh. I mean, seven foot six can drib can shoot off the dribble, can do some crazy shit. There's no way he's human, right? Yeah, it's well, it's gonna be fascinating. Like I said, you know, we're waiting next year. He, you know, France, even though they were disappointing in the FIBA World Cup, they're gonna be in the Olympics as the host. And you know, if they get Wemby and let's say Embiid chooses France over over the U.S., I mean. There's a world in which they're running out of front line, which I, I don't think they would do this, but it would be fascinating to watch if they had Wemby at the three, Embiid at the four, and Gobert at the five. I don't think they would actually do that, but I would be fascinated to watch that. The Olympics is in France. Yeah, it's in Paris next year. Okay, I'm sending an email today. I want credentials for that. Yeah, man, um, you gotta get your ass over there. I mean, that. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's when you know we're talking about Jokic and and Giannis and Embiid. They didn't play in this, but there's a good chance that they're healthy. All of those guys are are going to go to the World Cup. You know, I think Jokic will at least take a little bit of a break from his off season horse racing. Maybe participate in the in the Olympics for a little bit. And I, I think it could be a really fascinating Olympics. And for Team USA. Going back to them for a minute here, you know, last World Cup was basically the Celtics that, that represented the USA and they finished in seventh. That was not pleasant. That was not a not a good representation <laughs> for Team USA. This year, they finished in fourth, slightly better, not great. You know, obviously they won the gold medal in between, so they have that to lean on. But you look at this team, this version of Team USA, who are the guys that at least made enough of an impression that you think Despite the fourth place finish, these are guys that I think I would like to see for the Olympics next year. Yeah, I think Edwards has to be number one on that list, yeah. right? Um, I thought Reeves did a really good job as a connecting piece. I know a lot of people weren't happy with him defensively, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. But every team full of star talent needs a connector that's going to just yeah. scale his role up and down. Could you find somebody else, as we discussed, I think it was you that mentioned it maybe, a yeah. certain hairless Boston a certain, Celtic. A certain hairless Boston Celtic point guard, our guy, Derek White. You know, I mean, I do think that's it. And he was also, which is funny, part of that fake Celtics seventh place finish. Derek White also <laughs> on that team. So even future Celtics were impacting that FIBA World Cup team. Um, negatively. Negatively. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it is funny to think about because, you know, that Austin Reeves, I think. So you're, to your point, Anthony Edwards, definitely. I think Mikhail Bridges and Anthony Edwards are the two for me that I look yeah. at that. I think the two of them, maybe not solidified a spot, but they they should have, they have a really good case to be. By the way, that Mikhail Bridges three point shot to send it to overtime was pretty crazy. That was a that was a fun play in that game, despite how overtime went. But you know, with Austin Reeves, he's another guy that I thought about because offensively, I totally agree. He's the guy that you need. He can spot up. He can handle the ball. He's not going to worry about you know his shot. But also, if he need, if he's kind of feeling it, he's used to playing with LeBron and AD who really empowered him to be like, Hey man, you, you, you can run this show too. Like if you got it, go for it. And so he's going to be, you know, he's going to feel comfortable picking his spots. If like Tatum and Durant don't have it going, if they, you know, if they're there yeah. and he needs to, you know, kind of, kind of step, like you said, kind of fluctuate up and down to, to what his role is defensively. That's the big question because a lot of international teams, which you don't see as much, you know, in the, in the NBA really attacked him in the post, regardless if they had, you know, a wing or they had a big, they got switched. It was fine. Austin Reeves in the post. And part of that was, 
you know, the big men for Team USA, which I felt, by the way, I felt really proud about the three-man weave. We had the debate about US bigs, and I heard it on about three different podcasts later that week. That's because about, everyone's listening to us and then being like, I that's know. a great topic. I know. GWE, not getting the credit in these streets. Not getting the credit in the podcast streets. But I, no, I Cite your sources, topic. bitches. Cite your sources. Same topic out there. It's just a lack of US bigs. So, I mean that's where i think austin reeves would be a bit of a question but that's that's why i suggested you know Derek white he can do a lot of the similar offensive traits that austin reeves can bring but is going to bring a better defensive presence although you know if you're getting jonas valanciunas on Derek white in the post and there's it's not the, the, the right help it's still not going to go well you know what i mean so it, it kind of depends what you're looking for but i do think Derek white's an interesting name as that accentuator type for a team usa next summer yeah and i think that when you look at it i personally think that the system team USA ran didn't get the best out of Halliburton. I don't think it got. That's the best another guy out. that I think for for next summer he's at least put himself in a position to be one of those last spots. Yeah, and I think that when you look at his assist numbers and his create on ball creation and stuff, and the way he's empowered to play with Indiana versus Harry Hooper's empowered to play for Team USA, there's still a lot of room for growth on the international game for him. Banquero, I also don't think was featured the way he needed to be mm -hmm. to be successful. Uh, obviously, one of the one of the downsides to being a young star is when you go onto a team with other stars that maybe aren't as young. You know, so yeah. they're still young but not as young. You have to fall in line and take what role you've got. And some of these guys were successful for the early parts of their careers. Banquero, one year clearly, um, yeah. because they're being featured. They're a primary out. Look, you know what I mean? On their team, on their NBA team. It's not the same for Team USA. I've got the question. I've got more than who who goes to the Olympics because obviously I do feel like there's going to be stars traveling there. There's a point to prove now. There's a pride at stake at this mm -hmm. point. But is Steve Kerr the guy to be the head coach in that Olympic run? Because a lot of people feel like he didn't adapt his coaching style to the team that he had he tried to get the team that he had to adapt to his coaching style yeah. and that's never great when you've got such a short window to generate team unity and then go for success and it's kind of funny right because i was, I was looking at this the other day when i was watching uh, I think one of the games but i mean it's and i don't know the full coaching staff but the top three are steve kerr ty Lue, and eric spolstra like it's nuts it, dude it, Right. Like if you're going through the NBA right now and how, you know, we, we just had Seth part now on and we did the tiers of, of different players. If you're doing tiers of coaches, those are three guys that are either in, you know, tier one a or tier one. Like those, those are three of the top five to seven coaches in the NBA right now that you have on that staff. So it's an extremely, you know, well respected staff or, or you know the, the reputation of those and accomplished are. as well that's accomplished the thing. right between what spo's done what you know what um what steve kerr's done ty lu's got a championship as well like you know that's there's there's a lot on that on that coaching staff so i think it's tough because once again this is always the toughest part about doing what we do and trying to comment on coaching we don't see what a lot of what happens behind the scenes and how in that game you know how much does kerr really lean over to spo and say what do you think you know and how much is spo having an impact or is it you know kerr's laying down the law and then lou and and spo are just given you know they're like hey they're hanging back they got a respect factor like we don't really know what those dynamics are so I, I think it's tough to to put it on Kerr, but I do think that he probably, I mean, he clearly didn't adjust enough with the Jaron Jackson piece was a disaster. And, you know, Greg brought up the great point of, you know, there's a reason in Memphis he's always had Steven Adams or Jonas next to him. Yeah. You know, you, you got to put Kessler out there. You got to put Portis and, you know, uh, Jaron Jackson out there or something. You got you to work for something different. And they just never made that adjustment. So I, I think it's a fair point, but I, I don't know what you do because I think it's a really great coaching staff. So it's tough to say, you know, here's the answer. You switch it to Spo. Spo's on the staff. You know, that's probably the first name that would come to mind. So I, I don't really know what you do, but I think it's a fair point. You give it Greg Popovich and you just ride it all the way to a championship. Yeah. 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 I will say this. I want to give Greg his flowers re real quick. We've just kind of bragged that the, the big man discussion we had on GWE, I think it was in the last episode, was then spoke about in a couple of places. Since Greg pointed it out to me, and I don't know if it's a coincidence or whether Greg deserves to be cited for, you know, cite your sources. Um, I do think that 
from when Greg pointed that out, I've read or heard it in at least four different spots. Yeah, it's been, it's been yeah. everywhere, man. That's why I said I'm, I'm, I'm proud. Greg's that we out here just creating here. trends, dude. Man, I just want to give him some flowers real quick. He's not with us today. He's handling his business. Um, is this, He's not sick now, is he? No, he's not sick. He's traveling back. He did a little, uh, little, little beach vacation before, uh, before the it. end of end the summer here. Building so sandcastles. He's on his way shit. traveling back. Yeah, man. He's got his, he got his toes in the sand, having a good time. So, uh, but yeah, man. No, like I said, ahead of the curve with that discussion, a disappointing result for Team USA. And real quick before we go on, man, do, do you want to give um, your favorite player in the NBA, Dennis Schroeder, some some flowers here for Germany and, and being the MVP of the tournament? Hey, man, the sun shines on the dog's ass some days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, uh, now, look, I think that Schroeder, I don't like, I didn't like Schroeder's fit in Boston. To this day, I will stand on that. I didn't think Schroeder fit the way the team wanted to play. I didn't think that he was there to elevate the team as much as he was to elevate, elevate his own contractual value. Um, I think he plays better for Germany. He plays harder. Yeah. There's, pro- there's national pride at stake. He's very... You know, um, a lot of players are like that, especially in other sports. Um, obviously, I'm not a, a soccer football guy, but growing up in England, you hear about it all the time. This player doesn't. This player plays like trash for his soccer club, but when you put him on his national, Paul Pogba being that—that that was such a narrative here that even if you don't follow football slash soccer. Mm-hmm. It was in your face every day. Paul Pogba does not play well for Man United. You put him in the French team and he's the best midfielder in the world. Um, And I feel like Dennis Schroeder's kind of like that for Germany. He plays at a good level in the NBA, but he just finds that next gear when he's with Germany, right? And I think that a lot of this, and I've said this a million times and I'll say a million more, these European guys, when they're playing in FIBA tournaments, they're playing in the rule set that, that most of them grew up playing in yeah. like they're going back to what feels comfortable do you know what i mean like there's very few european guys that uh have come through the the aau high school cut like that system a lot of them come through over in europe develop 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 get drafted so then they adjust to the nba rule set so for a lot of guys playing in fiba competitions just going back to where they excelled before they moved to the nba and the rule set change doesn't seem that drastic, but it makes a big difference, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially when that's what you're comfortable with and that's what you know. And that's why you see some of these results where shout out to Dennis Schroeder, shout out to Daniel Tice, former Celtics. They are world champions. I'm comfortable driving on the English side of the road. I can do it in America and drive on your side of the road. I can do it. I'm, I've done it. I'm okay with it. I'm still more comfortable when I get back on because that's what I'm used to. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's the same. I think that's a good comparison. I like that. I like that. You can do it, but it feels more comfortable when you're, when you're doing what you know and what you grew up doing. So that's a wrap on, on FIBA World Cup. That's the last real competitive basketball we're going to see until the NBA season tips off. So oh, we'll man. find a way to fill the void, but let's take a quick break and then we'll talk some Celtic specific here. Celtic star Jason Tatum had a chance to sit down with Jeff Goodman of The Messenger. We'll hit that in one second. All right, Adam. So uh, a few days ago here, probably about four days ago or so, Jeff Goodman came out with an article on The Messenger, as I mentioned, about Jason Tatum, uh, where Jason Tatum really had some some interesting things to say that I think, honestly, it, it felt a little bit like a Celtics fan's wet dream of what they wanted to hear Jason Tatum <laughs> say in the offseason. You know, what are the things that that you're looking for from your star, from your leader, talking about being on the Mount Rush, Rushmore of Celtics history, talking about him and JB and what it would mean to win one together, talking about wanting to be all defense. You know, what from the that article or Tatum's comments, you know, really stood out to you? OK, first of all, the reason I laughed so hard is because when you said it, I had an image in my head of lots of little sperms wearing Celtic hoodies going, <laughs> yay! Um, <laughs> like, it's one of, like it's one of those like Disney movies, but instead it's just like Celtics and little sperm that are little sperms are just around. heading towards the TD garden in hoodie yeah. Celtics hoodies like, fuck yeah! <laughs> um, <laughs> it really tickled me. I wish that you could have seen the image in my head. Uh, if anyone okay, out but, there is good at animation, we'd love to, we'd love to get a little uh, please, a little animated clip of that. That'd be great. Please, that would be great, and we'll put it all over our social media clips. I'm going to try and mess around <laughs> with that on some uh, AI as well. Uh, okay, so what was my biggest takeaways? Um, obviously, he ended with the, 
and some Celtics fans took this wrong. Most of it took it the way it was meant. You never know what the future holds, but he it would be hard to leave Boston. I don't think he wants to go anywhere. I don't think he that's in his plans. Obviously, the last thing he wants to do is put himself in a Kyrie Irving situation and be like, I plan on being here and then not be here and be hated. Mm -hmm. he, I think he genuinely does want to be on that Celtics Mount Rushmore. And I think that he feels... And he feels similar to the way most fans feel. Like they're on the precipice of being a team that could contend for championships for the next seven, eight, nine years, right? Yeah. I think that he's ready to do that. And those were kind of my two biggest takeaways. The Jalen Brown stuff, you know, he said what he said about JB, like he deserved it. He, yeah. You know, this, um, okay, cool. I'm, I'm on that. I'm very big on the JB JT partnership, but I'm also very realistic that even two years, there's still no ring. We need to reevaluate that duo. Well, we're, um, we're going to get to that. Cause that's part of the article that you have coming out in the next day or two. But, you know, I, I think to that last point, that's probably partially why, you know, JT wasn't a hundred percent committal, right. To, Oh, I'll be here yeah. forever because he knows like, he's realistic. Like if this doesn't go, you know, if they don't win a championship or at least get back to the finals once or twice in the next two years before his deal kicks in, like there's a very real chance that, you know, we, we've talked about it before, you know, something had to change. Joe Mazzula got one very up and down, uneven year to prove himself. And so they, they kind of kicked that can down the road. Jalen Brown gets the deal. They trade Marcus Smart. That's piece one, right? Piece two, before we get to, you know, JT wants out is a combo of, another coaching change which would be the fourth one that we're going through in the last couple of years if it gets to that point or it's trading Jalen Brown the next two years you know what I mean like those are the the next two avenues and when that happens you know who's to say that JT you know you know I, I would I would certainly say Ime is more JT's coach than the Missoula is at this point um you know as far as what we the way we've heard him talk about the two coaches uh but obviously JB's his guy and if JB's out you know who's to say that JT is not like listen this ain't the Celtics that I grew up with there's no more smart. There's no more JB. You know, Brad's up in the in the front office. Like, this ain't for me anymore, man. I I want to I want to move on. Like, that's that's a distinct possibility that if it, it goes that route. Now, obviously, we hope it doesn't because in the article he talks about how gratifying it would be for him and JB to that they're due to get over that hump, as he puts it. That you know, for them to win a championship together. That, you know, it's almost to a degree like how Dame Lillard has felt in years past about I want to do it in Portland. I want to be that guy that stayed and do it. And of course, it's all changing now because things change. Uh, but JT talking about what it would mean for him and JB to win a championship made me think of uh, when the Bucks won the championship. And if you remember that embrace that Giannis and Middleton had because they had been there, they had been there, you know, together from really the start and built up that Bucks team. And of course, holiday was the missing piece that came in. And the Celtics are hoping for Zingas is that missing piece that kind of comes in and takes it to, to that next level. But, you know, I, I think for me, that really stood out that it's like, he wants that. That's, that's goal. Number one is me is, is for JT. It's JT and JB on that podium, embracing and giving that post game interview with Adam silver, you know, talking about you know winning an nba championship finally that's the ultimate goal so that was one of the biggest things i took away from the article yeah and i think that the other thing you need to take well you don't need to but the other thing i took away from it was when he was like i've developed an affinity a relationship a connection with the city of boston yeah that to me says as well like hey I, don't, I really don't want to go anywhere. This is my city now. Do you know what I mean? He even said in that interview, like, you know, I came to Boston and I was like, I'm a St. Louis kid. I'm yeah. from St. Louis. He's like, now it's kind of like, yeah, I'm from St. Louis, but I'm also from Boston. And, and he mentioned, right? It's kind of funny to think about it. Deuce Tatum's a Bostonian. Deuce yeah. Tatum is like, you know what I mean? Like, like when we, like we, we say on the show, you know, me and Greg, we live in Austin, Texas, but we grew up in Dorchester. Dorchester is, you know, is right in the, is the biggest part, biggest area of Boston, right? As far as like towns, there's like 13 towns that make up Boston. Dorchester is the biggest part of it. Like Deuce Tatum is a Bostonian. He's a Boston kid. He, I'm sure he's not going to grow up with the same, you know, accent that Greg and I can throw on when we need to. If you go find, you know, my old college clips of, of me talking about the Bridgewater State Bears, like he's not going to probably grow up in that. That sense of Bostonian, but all he knows is living in Boston. So it's interesting to think about the Jason Tatum, you know, feeling more connected. And part of that is, you know, is Deuce growing up in the city. This is this is what Deuce knows. Of course, he goes and travels with his dad, but on a consistent basis, Deuce knows Boston life. He's a Bostonian. 
And to be fair with you, having been to Boston now, the city's bomb. Like staying there makes sense. And in my head, I believe that if him and Brown can win a ring together, and then Brown wants to go somewhere and be the guy, I think Tatum stays at that point mm-hmm. because he knows that not only is he already he's, he's on the Mount Rushmore now, he's one of the best Celtics of all time. He knows that the Celtics will build another team around him, and there's another ring or two down the line. Whether Brown ups that, I do genuinely believe that if they win a ring, I think there's a risk of one of the two wanting to, to bounce. Mm-hmm. I, I think because they've achieved that goal. And if they're anything like me, and these guys are way more competitive than what I am because I'm sitting here and they're not, they're millionaires. <laughs> Once you achieve a goal, it's right, what's the next goal? What's next? Yeah. You know, can I lead it? Can and Brad, for Brand that might be I've I've won a championship as the number two. Can I go somewhere, be the number one and win a championship? Right. That's the next goal. Because that Tatum, enhances his legacy to a whole exactly, new level, right? A whole new level. And for Tatum, it could be well, I won a championship with a top 15, top 20 wing player next to me. If Brown, if Brown does leave, maybe I say to Brad, go and get me an elite big man. And I'll try and emulate the Kobe years. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Go and get, and you know, there's different goals that could come from that. And I do think that Tatum would more than likely want to achieve that next goal in Boston, but maybe playing alongside a different type of player. Whereas for Brown, it's about elevating and being that first option. Again, this is all just conjecture. For sure. And I think Tatum acknowledging the historical aspect of it. I thought that was at least interesting, right? Because I don't think there's always that awareness with, you know, NBA players of, of the history before them. But obviously with the Celtics, that's that's very prevalent. When you when you walk into the arena, you see the championship banners, you see all the players with their retired numbers. And he talks about, you know, that Mount Rushmore of Celtics history. And, you know, I, I mean, I was thinking mountain. about this the other day. It's it, it's a big mountain, but I, I mean, it's. I think a spot is there for his taking. You know what I mean? I mean, you look at Russell and Bird are cemented, right? No one, no one's taking Russell and Bird off. Uh, if we're eliminating, you know, we're not going to put red on there. If we're just limiting to players, you know, those last two spots are, are pretty debatable as to, you know, who gets that spot. I think Havlicek probably has an inside uh, inside track on, on being a pretty solid third member. And then that, that fourth and fifth spot kind of just depends on your generation, right? Are you looking more at McHale? Are you looking at Paul Pierce? If you're in our generation, are you looking at a Bob Cousy or maybe even a Tommy Heinsohn for his contributions as a player? And then if you think yeah. about, you know, him as a coach and a broadcaster, like, so there's multiple arguments, but, when you look at where Jason Tatum is right now in his career trajectory, he's made three all NBAs already four all stars, two first team, all NBAs, one third team, all NBA. And right now he's pretty widely considered somewhere in the fifth to seventh best player. Love Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce was never really in that conversation of he's a top five guy in the league. So Tatum as the lead dog, you know, if he's able to to win a championship, at least one, that's hard enough as it is. But if he were to get two and he's considered a top five guy, he's already got two top five MVP finishes, you know, to his resume. That's something a lot of Celtics don't have outside of Larry Bird and Bill Russell. There's yeah. not a lot of top MVP finishes. So Jason Tatum's already in that elite category. You know, we know he's one of the best scorers in the league. If he becomes an old NBA defender, which is entirely possible, you know, that's another part of his resume. So you know, for Tatum to talk about that Mount Rushmore and it being, in in my opinion, fully attainable, you know, for him over these next seven to eight years with what he does with his resume. Like, I, I think that's a pretty interesting piece when you think about Jason Tatum here long term. The fact that he's taking into account the historical part of the of Celtics lure and legacy that goes along with who he is and who he can be as a player. Yeah, I think at the moment, like the way I look at it is. His legacy at the moment could be, if there's no championship, he's the best of the rest, mm-hmm. right? He's the best Celtic to never win a championship. He, he's in that conversation at the moment. One chip, I think that starts to really put him in those discussions of maybe he's one of the better ones that yep. won one champion, win two or three. Now you're definitely in that conversation of, dude, he has to be on that Mount Rushmore. Yeah. He's going to cement himself. He's going to be, you know, in that you know, like we said, Bird and Russell guaranteed Havelcheck probably on there. And then it's like that fourth spot. If Tatum gets a championship, certainly two, then that fourth spot is, you know, really become something that that could be his. But Adam, to get to that, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about an article that I know you have coming out uh, should be later this week here by the time you're hearing this. All right, Adam. So for Jason Tatum, 
to ascend to that Mount Rushmore. Something that is now a very, very critical piece of that puzzle is the addition of Chris Dapps Porzingis. And I know you have an article that you're working on right now, so I'm going to let you take the floor here. But Chris Dapps Porzingis, this is, as we've talked about, with the futures of Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum being intertwined, there may be no bigger part of, of what happens in the future of the Jays than Chris Dapps Porzingis. So tell me a little bit about what you got going on in the article about the last roll of the dice for the Celtics to make the Jays work could come down to Chris Dapps Porzingis. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to premise this with it's the dead of summer, guys. Like, I'm struggling to find things to write about. You know, give your boy some leeway right now. It's a good topic. It kind of interested me. I, I wanted to write about it, but it doesn't mean I believe like it's it's the off season. All right, give me some time. Give me some space. Leave me be. Please read it though. Um, and the premise is simply just that, right? So, the, the the way I've kind of gone about this is Brad Stevens is pragmatic. Everything Brad Stevens has done as a coach since his move to the front office has been very pragmatic, very realistic, very confined to can it make the team better? There's check marks, checks and balances that is input. And then you go through this last playoffs, which honestly were kind of a clusterfuck. Like you shouldn't have gone six games against Atlanta. There's no way you should have gone seven games against Philly. And you really shouldn't have been fighting a game seven against a Miami team that had to fight for fight for the playing tournament mm-hmm. to even get into the like it was a, it, there was some good moments, but you should never have been in those situations in the first place, right? So Brad Stevens goes right then. Something needs to change. We bring in Chris Stapps, Paul Zingas. New CBA comes in. Second tax apron. It's going to be hard. We still super max Jalen Brown. Okay, cool. Made sense. Keep your best two players happy. Keep them around. Bring in a third guy, an elite big man, or a close to elite big man, depending on what your views are. Obviously, with big, sometimes there's injury histories, injury concerns. You, you get that with KP. But this is, to me, the last roll of the dice. If things don't work out now, if you've tried it with guards, right? You've tried to give Tatum and Brown this elite guard. You gave them Kyrie Irving. You gave them Kemba Walker. Granted, those guards were the first option at the time, right? Jalen, Jason was two, Jalen was three. Things have changed a little bit now. Paul Zingas is coming in as that third option. He's not coming in at the one. Maybe he'll be a second option and Brown takes a step back, but you don't super max a guy and then take him, yeah. tell him to be a third option. Well, I mean, that's just negative value. No, you don't do that. But what I do think is if Paul Zingas can't get this team over the hump, then he's going to be seen as a guy that can produce on teams where he's the number one guy and they're not really going anywhere, which is pretty much what he did last year for Washington, right? Yeah. Number right. one guy in on the team. They're not really going anywhere. You're numb to you big number one guy. Yeah. Your numbers are empty calories at that point. You're all, you know, you're all name, no game type of thing. Yeah. Or yeah. You, you perform on, in certain, certain situations. So you're you're not really going to get back elite value for Kristaps Porzingis in a trade. Well, then what the hell do you do? Because you're yeah. confined now. Because by the time you make that decision with Porzingis, you've already committed the supermax to Jason Tatum too. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, a lot of this is a timing thing, right? Yeah, because like you said, the new CBA, Jalen just got his supermax. We're two seasons away from Tatum's supermax, which is going to supersede Jalen's supermax. <laughs> kicking in and that's really expensive for your for your top two guys and you know you've got poor Zingas. you got you got a lot of this core right now it's on a similar timeline as far as how their contracts line up so you do have that stability but there's not a ton of options to pivot the only thing that really is the celtics other than making this poor Zingas situation work which also requires him to stay healthy requires others on the team to stay healthy as well too you know there's other factors that go into it But the only other move that they would have is they've been pretty good about maintaining their draft pick flexibility. And so loading up a a move that is centered around draft picks that teams start to look at some cracks in the Celtics roster. And they're like, okay, you know what? These picks in 2029 or 2030, depending on when we're looking at this. Could be valuable. Exactly. So, and then that's really, you know, like to your point of this being the last roll of the dice, that might be the only other scenario. And even then that gets really tricky because then, you know, 
it's probably not going to be Dame at that point, but who's the next Dame, right? Who's the next older star that maybe you could put together a, you know, a, a Brogdon and Rob Williams with a bunch of picks package to go get whatever else or whoever else it might be. I mean, and maybe that's an option, but I, I don't think that's one that, that is all that appealing. And that, that really feels we're, we're one step away from getting desperate is kind of my point that I'm getting. Yeah. And this is kind of the premise of the article. And it kind of brings me back to that finding a different partnership for Tatum, right? This is the last roll of the dice at having an opportunity to be a contending team with Tatum and Brown because of the way the finances are structured at this point. So if Porzingis isn't that dude, if over the next two years you're still close but no cigar and you move on from Porzingis, now you need to, now we start having discussions about do we tra- trade Jalen Brown? And mm-hmm. to me, I do think that Stevens kind of threw that pragmatism out the window this summer and was like, yo, we need to go for it. We're right on the precipice. We're going to push our chips all in. We need a big man that can space the floor, that can rebound, that can score off the dribble. We need somebody like Paul Zingas to take the load off of Al Horford because yeah. the Celtics relied heavily on Horford's floor spacing ability. And then when that disappeared in the playoffs, you what, saw the trouble. It, yeah, teams just loaded up towards the perimeter and there was nothing you could do. And I do think that, you know, for all the penetration that Malcolm Brogdon gives you, I have the same issue with him as what I had with Schroeder. He penetrates and he comes off screens a ton, but he never rewards the role, man. He doesn't reward the big. And teams learn that. Teams get savvy. Yeah. Then they start, you know, somebody will rotate over and kill that drive, knowing that the kick out to a, to a Horford isn't really going to be there. It's going to be two passes away. Um, so then you do kind of have to ask yourself, right, if this Paul Zingas deal doesn't work, Brown's committed to a long-term deal. Tatum's going to be committed to a long-term deal. Something somewhere has got to give. Let's yeah. see what we can get back for Jalen Brown in terms of a an elite big, in terms of somebody, I don't know, I don't know how any names come into my head right now, but let's bring in a high-level big man or let's bring in a high-level guard. Let's try and get flip a Jalen Brown plus as many well, picks because, in like, the do, world do your for point a shot. Of, of throwing, yeah, throwing Jalen Brown. Like, that, that's Because like you said, that's how you get Value. You're not going to get the value for Chris Stapp's Porzingis. It's a little bit like the the position's different, but but similar to the position that Minnesota's in right now, right? They just gave up a ton for Rudy Gobert, and they need to change something. But they're probably not get they're not getting back what they gave out for Rudy no. Gobert. So they have to look at Carl Anthony Towns, right? We just yeah. talked about how Anthony Edwards was, and you're probably not trading him. So it's like, all right, well, I guess Cat's the move then. And and you know, Atlanta just did this with John Collins. They they moved off of John Collins finally, and now if it doesn't work, then it's kind of like, all right, well, let's reboot this and let's see what we can get for Trey Young. We don't have anybody else that we can get significant value enough back for that's really going to make a difference for us. And we'll we'll rekick this thing with Dejounte Murray, maybe. You know what I mean? So. It, that that's the the position on a higher scale that I think the Celtics have the potential to find themselves in. Now, obviously, that's not that's not the route that that we're hoping it goes or that they're planning for it to go. But these are all possibilities when you're looking at this. You know, the when you're looking at the multiverse of of things that could happen. It's, it is. It's. I was just going to agree. It is. Uh, it's a genuine possibility, and it was a big concern heading into Jalen Brown's contract. It, we knew that this could be, you know, Jalen Brown's contract kind of hamstrings you in a certain way because mm-hmm. that like, it does push you closer to that second day from uh, Tatum's contract then cements you as we're all in on these guys and if it doesn't work, everyone around them is marginal value. Derek White will have value. He'll be one of the most valuable guys. Rob Williams will have some value. Everyone else is marginal apart from Paul Zingas, obviously. Yeah. So what do we do? If we really need to change a core aspect of this rotation, Jalen Brown has to be that guy, unfortunately. And that's kind of the whole premise of the article. This Paul Zingas was that last roll of the dice to keep these two guys together and elevate them to a championship level. If it doesn't work, then that duo is done. And that sucks real, real hard. Yeah, that's I mean, that that's that's the unfortunate reality. But I think the other side of this coin is this is a gamble that needed to happen, or this is a gamble that, in, in, you know, and obviously, you know, it, it, it sucks to see a guy like Marcus Smart be be the one that goes. But if you're going to change something, and I had a conversation with a friend this weekend where, you know, we, we were kind of talking about he, he was a Miami Heat fan. And we were talking about like what was missing with with Tatum and he was like you know Tatum's just not that that leader that Jimmy Butler is and you know I, I mean I think Tatum he talked about it in the article he leads a different way like I think that's you know I, and I think that's totally fine but 
I do think that, you know, both Tatum and Brown are or were, I should say, a little bit too reliant on, hey, Marcus is the vocal leader of this team. He's the one that is going to set the tone. And that kind of needs to come from the top, right? It can't come from your third, fourth best player. Uh, and then that leads to, you know, some of those Marcus Smart moments where, yeah, he could bail you out, but he could also shoot you in the foot sometimes when he feels like he's the one that should shoot six threes in the fourth quarter. You know what I mean? So, and then that needs to be coming from the Jays. The Jays need to be, if the ship's going down, it damn well better be, you know, the Jays that are kind of steering that ship. Yeah. And then if they decide, all right, hey, poor Zinga's got it going tonight. Zinger, you're up. You know, that's that's one thing. But Marcus Smart was kind of that that alpha, right? And, and yeah, he was like, Jays, I don't have it going right now, but I'm going to go get it going. So keep giving exactly. me the ball anyway. Exactly. And that, was- and that needs to be from the Jays. So point being, I, you know, it's a roll of the dice. It's a gamble. I think it's a necessary one. And sometimes that's that's what you need. You need to take a calculated risk to ultimately get over that hump and achieve your your true goal, which is to win a championship. And, and that's what I think this is. And that's and that's where while we are on the precipice of what could be a very scary, a bumpy ride over the next year or two, ultimately it could be what this team needs as well. And so at a certain point, you either just sit there stuck in the mud and you say, Hey, listen. We're close. Maybe we'll get there. Maybe we won't. Or you take a chance. And and that's where the Celtics are at right now at this crossroads is Brad Stevens decided to take a chance. And we've said it all offseason. Lower floor, but a higher ceiling. And and that's what I think is the story of, of at least this team as we, we get closer and closer to training camp. I'd like to be at training camp already. Hey man, we are we're crawling there. We're crawling there, it's but it's crawling, dude. But we're gonna get there, man. We're gonna get there. So hopefully, you know, as we as we wrap up this episode, hopefully there's gonna be more things for us to talk about in the coming days. I will say, Adam, as we're recording here, uh, Sham Sarania just came out with a report that LeBron is ready to commit to the 2024 Olympic team and has already started recruiting a team. So LeBron, to the point of what we're talking about with coaches and recruiting, apparently LeBron has already taken this on. Uh, it says he's already spoken to guys like Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, Jason Tatum, Draymond Green, and then there's also uh, mentions of Devin Booker, Dame Lillard, De'Aaron Fox, Kyrie Irving, Anthony Edwards, Mikhail Bridges. So looks like, uh, back to our original conversation as we wrap up this episode, looks like Team USA is is trying to bring back a lot Superstar, of the man. It's, it's the monsters, dude. It's the monsters. Yeah. So that will hopefully be a, a different result in Paris if they do bring out the LeBron James, Steph Curry's, Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum's of the world. But Adam, that's going to do it for this episode here. Let's put a bow on it. It has, as always, been a pleasure catching up with you on a Monday morning here. We will be back later this week with more Green with Envy coverage. As always, we appreciate y'all for following us. Make sure you go ahead, give us a like on both Uh, Spotify, Apple, leave a review. We'd love to see some of those come in uh, as well as make sure you are following us on the YouTube, baby. Get on the YouTube. Yeah, I'm calling it that. The The YouTube. YouTube. Get on it. Subscribe. We appreciate y'all. Have a great week and we will chat soon. Peace. Deuces.